better with the microphone on. All right, so um, today, well, first of all, today, we do have the next, I we mean you, <laughs> the next homework assignment due. Um, this is the first of the dinosaur diversity homeworks. They give you, a, I think, a better sense of what the second exam is going to be like, because it's going to concentrate on, rather than basic methods um, and background information, you're actually employing that to understand the diversity of dinosaurs and their origin and so forth. All right, but today in terms of lecture, we start our two-part look at the sauropodomorpha. So we've looked, made our way through Ornithischian diversity in the last three lectures. Uh, now we're going to look at sauropodomorphs today and on Monday. Uh, and then the theropods, the carnivorous dinosaurs, will take us um, several lectures to get through because of their huge diversity. So, um, you know, depending on which flavor of hypotheses of dinosaurian origins and, and basal branching you use, sauropodomorphs are either the first branch to come off uh, under the Ornithoskeleta hypothesis, um, or are the sister group to Ornithischia under the very much minority and less well-supported um, Phytodinosaurian hypothesis. But the one we're going with here is sort of the standard model, classic uh, interpretation, and that is that sauropodomorphs are the sister group to theropods, the carnivorous dinosaurs, collectively in the group Sorischia, and although this isn't important for the class, it's in the lecture notes and, and in the previous lectures in the background, uh, that those two are more closely related to each other than either are to some basal branches like herrerasaurs. Okay, so one thing we could say about uh, sauropodomorphs is by some metrics, they're one of the most successful groups of dinosaurs uh, because we have really good representation of them throughout the Mesozoic. They are among the oldest dinosaurs we have in the record. And as you can see here for these basal parts of, dinos uh, of sauropodomorpha, these are the groups we'll be dealing with today. Uh, they sort of show up relatively stepwise throughout the Triassic, Jurassic, uh, and um, fill up most of that space. There aren't a huge number of big gaps, or some, but aren't a huge number of big gaps in their history. And we saw that was different than the Ornithischians, for whom we have maybe one specimen in the Triassic. Um, and we'll see, you know, theropods somewhat in between the two. All right, OK, this is, once again, not quite working here. Let's see. There we go. And here's the, the cladogram with the, the features on it uh, from the lecture notes for the early parts of Sauropodomorpha. The uh, lecture on Monday is going to concentrate on this derived group, the neosauropods. Okay, so this name, Sauropodomorpha, kind of an ugly name. Uh, it's not my fault. <laughs> uh, first of all, this, as a clade, they're basically the long-necked plant eaters. But the name of the group of, as, the, as a whole actually points to one of their primary members. So it's different than Theropoda or Ornithischia or whatever. One of the primary members is actually in the group name, and that's Sauropoda. So, Sauropoda, as I'll talk about uh, later this lecture, is the worst dinosaur name out there. It's not a bad as a name, it's just one of the least applicable names. Because the name means lizard-footed ones, and the feet of sauropods are about as unlizard like as, as is imaginable. Uh, but hey, we're stuck with that name. So sauropodomorpha is simply the sauropod forms. So you know, sauropods and their kin. And it comprises, as a group, the derived sauropoda, and then less specialized earlier branches that in the old days we would refer to as prosauropods. That's a paraphyletic group. You know, it's any sauropodomorph that's not lucky enough to be a sauropod, but hey. Um, they first appear early in the late Triassic. They die out at the end of the Cretaceous. And not only did they fill up a lot of that space, they were also the first successful group of dinosaurs. We saw that Ornithischians were vanishingly rare, at least so far, in the, um, in the Triassic record. Uh, you know, unless Silosaurids are Ornithischians, in which case they're, they're at least present. Theropods, we'll see, are around in the Triassic, but they're not super abundant. Uh, Herrerasaurs, present in the Triassic, but not super abundant. But by the second half of the late Triassic, sauropodomorphs are actually pretty common animals. 
So they're the first group of dinosaurs to be really successful. And I should throw out here um, a sort of cultural context for pretty much the first, you know, two-thirds, maybe even longer, of the 20th century. These were the archetypical dinosaurs. If you were to ask the general public what a dinosaur was, the default, the default image would be a sauropod. Um, you know, if you showed them a stegosaurus or a tyrannosaurus or a triceratops, uh, they would say, okay, that's a dinosaur too. But sort of the default image of dinosauria uh, in the early and mid 20th century was sauropods. But early ones don't look that much like the more derived members, the sauropoda. So here are some of the basal members of sauropodomorpha. First of all, they are small. They're only about one to two meters long. Well, that shouldn't be a surprise. The basal members of all dinosaur groups are about one to two meters long. The teeth suggest that they were omnivorous rather than strict herbivores. And as we'll see, the teeth of at least one suggest it's not even that. Suggest it suggests they were carnivores. Um, and that points to the fact that the ancestral dinosaur was probably carnivorous and that herbivory evolved independently in sauropodomorphs and in orthischians, and as we will see, in some theropods. And although the forelimbs are fairly strong, even in early basal sauropodomorphs, they're not adapted to weight bearing. They're not long, they, the hand can't really be put into a weight supporting position, so they were probably obligate bipeds, which is of course the ancestral condition for dinosaurs. So as projected here, these things are you know, comparable to life size. Um, so here's a couple more of these early forms, and we can see the teeth of early sauropodomorphs. So first of all, one thing that makes a sauropodomorph a sauropodomorph is that they've got this elongated neck, but to be fair, so do early theropods. And they also have a reduced skull size. So compared to the body, the skulls of early sauropods are on the, sorry, early sauropodomorphs are on the smallish size. And that's going to get more and more exaggerated as we go through their history. Also, like ornithischians, they had philodonts, that is leaf-shaped teeth. But whereas ornithischian, philod phil ornithischian philodont teeth tend to be relatively broad, those of sauropodomorphs tend to be relatively tall. And they've got these great big denticles on the side, these projections. Well, so do ornithischians, these big denticles on the side. So here is one of the best known early, one of the earliest and best known of the basal sauropodomorphs. This is Eoraptor, the dawn thief. Um, and the name, you know, you might, why is it called a raptor? Well, when initially discovered, it was thought to be a carnivorous dinosaur. It probably was an omnivorous dinosaur. Uh, but uh, that was due to a misinterpretation. And in fact, it was also, um, they were confusing it with another dinosaur that occurred in the same formation who we'll meet on Wednesday. So Eoraptor gives us a sense of what early sauropodomorphs look like. Here's a reconstruction of the whole animal. Um, and again, this is bigger than life size, but oh, you'll, actually, ah, you'll actually see a specimen of this, or it's a cast at the Smithsonian. And I should mention, I'll talk more about the Smithsonian project on Monday, but it went live yesterday. And remember, one of your graded items is to go downtown to the National Museum of Natural History and take the sort of guided tour. Um, there's a description of it in there and then input the answers from your observations that you make uh, onto ELMS and it's one of the graded items for the course. There's, a, there's an Eoraptor there. Now in the last um, was it five years now, something like that, um, this creature has shown up, Buriolestes. Um, and Buriolestes postcranially, so behind the skull, and even some of the skull bones, indicate it is indeed a sauropodomorph. But what's intriguing about it are its teeth. Because its teeth are most definitely those of a carnivore. Now, it probably was omnivorous. Many animals with this sort of general carnivorous dentition, the teeth, can eat plants as well. But it's still eating flesh. So this is probably ecologically the closest thing we have to the first sauropodomorph, so eating flesh, but very quickly becoming more um, uh, omnivorous. And uh, yeah, these guys were uh, among the oldest of uh, the sauropodomorphs too. So here we have flesh-eating Buriolestes, 
And then later on, uh, magna column here as an example, we get the ones with the actual philodont dentition for eating plants. And here's the Oedopter space, and you see some of the teeth are zyphodont, which is blade-like. We'll, we'll introduce that term uh, next week, are blade-like teeth, but some of them are a little broader, and they're better for chopping up plants. And we see, compared to that, uh, e, that's the teeth of a small theropod, the oldest theropod dinosaur that co-occurs in the same uh, time and space, in fact, the same location that Eoraptor was found at. So yes, they were omnivores, and if they got out of control, om -nom -nom omnivores. So those are the basal branches, later sauropodomorphs. How do they change? Well, the neck becomes proportionally even longer. And you know, sort of from this point on, sauropodomorphs uh, with some weird reversals uh, are characterized by having the longest necks of any dinosaurs of any dinosaur of their size, or indeed of almost any animal of their size, and proportionally much smaller heads. So here on Massospondylus, you know, the adult Massospondylus skull, much smaller, well, not much bigger actually than the skulls of some of those basal sauropodomorphs, although the animal itself is very much bigger. Also, sauropodomorphs from this point on, have very long femora. So that's a plural, plural of femur. Um, and it's an indication that they're definitely not doing any fast running. To have a long femur, a femur that's a lot longer than the lower bones of your legs, especially at small body size, uh, is saying that those are mostly weight-bearing. They're not really used for, for running. Here we go. So uh, um, Massospondylus is one of our best known of this next phase, but probably the best known in terms of numbers of skeletons and descriptions is this form, uh, Platyosaurus, or Platyosaurus, people use both names, which actually had been discovered about the same time that, um, that Owen named Dinosauria. Nothing as complete as the specimen you see here, but it had been discovered, and the Germans were writing about it, and had, Owen's original paper been on fossil reptiles, and not specifically British fossil reptiles, Platyosaurus probably would have made it into the initial batch of dinosaurs in the original description. But that's OK. Would have been interesting, because it would have been the only Triassic dinosaur at the time. Yeah? So I noticed, like, on a bunch of these later sauropodomorphs, they right. have this big crawling. Yes. Um, now, if you remember, when I talked about, so the, 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 he was observing that uh, sauropodomorphs have this great big claw, and I'll have pictures of that coming up. If you remember uh, my lecture at the, the base of Dinosauria, the rise of Dinosauria, one of the attributes that suggests um, that Saurischia is a monophyletic group relative to Ornithischians is the presence of an enlarged thumb claw. So early theropods have that and some later ones do too, and early sauropodomorphs. And indeed, many later sauropodomorphs retain a really big thumb claw when all the other claws get smaller. At this point, it's a big hook-like claw. You know, is it used for you know, grabbing food items? Well, initially, but something like Platyosaurus doesn't show any adaptations for omnivory. It's a herbivore. So it's almost certainly used for something else, but what else is hard to say. And when we get to something like Platyosaurus or Mastospondylus or Riojasaurus, we're in a phase of creatures that uh, some of us call the core prosauropods. And they're called that because this idea of prosauropoda, which some people used to use as a formal name, and indeed in some of the phylogenies in the 1980s and 90s, actually came out as a monophyletic group. Doesn't anymore. Totally paraphyletic. Um, these were the sorts of animals people were talking about because we didn't know those early branches yet. So the core prosauropods, the ones that the concept of what a prosauropod would be like, uh, are this phase of the history of, of um, sauropodomorphs. So these were the most dominant group of large-bodied herbivores in the, later, in the late Triassic and the early Jurassic. So this is that phase where they were sauropodomorphs, where dinosaurs themselves had become the most important group of large herbivores. This is still in the late Triassic in the world dominated by Pseudosuchians. But no, none of the herbivorous Pseudosuchians, the croc relatives, came anywhere near as close as some of these guys. 
This is also, and probably not coincidentally, as we'll see, the first group of large herbivores adapted to feeding higher in trees. Prior to that, you could be a very small-bodied herbivore and climb up into the trees, or you could be a big herbivore and you fed close to the ground. But you couldn't simultaneously be a big animal feeding high in the trees. These guys were the first. Today we have examples of things like giraffes that can do that. Um, and, and there are various other hoof mammals, elephants, and so forth. And these guys were big. A typical form is sort of the three to eight meter range. A couple of the very large ones up to about 10 meters. It's 33 feet. Yeah? Were they still obligate bipeds? Ah, we get to that. Great question. Were they still obligate bipeds? Um, we'll get to that in a moment. And that had been a matter of some debate for a while. So there's the skull of some of these forms from this part of the tree. And here's Platyosaurus itself, a specimen uh, at Yale. And some people uh, have looked at ridges on the face and a slight inset of the teeth and suggested, like some Ornithischians, maybe it had a cheek. But as we saw when I talked about Ornithischians, the evidence for a cheek isn't particularly strong. Maybe they had skin there. We don't know. It's not certain. So the question of, were they bipeds or quadrupeds or facultative bipeds? Well, for a long time, people either argued for quadrupedality, so that they were on all fours, or facultative bipeds, that they could walk around in their hind legs or could walk on all fours. And I used to support that latter idea. But newer studies, I say newer, but they're probably 15 years old now, looking at the details, in particular of the wrist, so the forearm and the wrist, showed that they couldn't turn their hands into this position, into a weight-bearing position. So if they couldn't put their hands in a position to actually walk on, like is shown in this reconstruction um, on the left, they weren't either. They weren't either facultative bipeds or quadrupeds. They had to have been obligate bipeds. So that one's out. And the illustration to the side, the photograph, is what they were doing. They were walking on all just the hind legs. So something you know like this. And that actually is probably part of their success. Being big animals, walking on their hind legs, gives them the easy ability to rear up, because all they have to do is pivot a little. And there they are, high up in the trees, where their only competition is animals smaller than their own head. So ah, onto the claw. Prosauropod forelimbs. As I mentioned, they can't move uh, their wrists in that position. They still, these retained pretty much the ancestral dinosaurian hand in terms of very small uh, digits four and five, ring and pinky, uh, and the ancestral saurischian attribute of having great big thumb claws. So there is an Ankysaurus, and it's curled in there, but there it is for Platyosaurus. However, we go from animals like these, which were obligate bipeds, to obviously, as we all know, later sauropods or quadrupeds. So that transition occurs, but it occurs at sort of the next phase in their history, at least for adults. Because it's worth noting that juveniles, and we have hatchlings of some of these groups, um, hatchlings of forms like massive spondylus show limb proportions that suggest, and body proportions, that suggest they were quadrupeds. And you can see up in this illustration, so first of all, here is the baby as it was found basically in the egg. Here's the same specimen. And that's comparing the size of a baby to an adult. Uh, also notice how compared to the adult, the baby's skull is very short in front of the eye. It's a very short snouted compared to the adult. So it looks like the babies were quadrupeds. And here's a restoration showing uh, his little hatchlings and their bipedal parents. Uh, and here's sort of an intermediate sized individual with little cropping teeth. Uh, and indeed, it's not just uh, massive spondylus that shows this. People have been looking at a number of different types of basal sauropodomorphs and other slightly more derived, sorry, of core prosauropods and um, slightly more derived forms. And they look like, yeah, they're, they're quadrupeds as babies, 
And then in this case, you know, quite early in their ontogeny, they become bipedal and then stay bipedal later on. Um, and people looked at it through a number of different like mechanical studies and so forth uh, to work that out. But of course, eventually we get to forms which are permanently quadrupedal. Now, before we get to that transition, let's say a bit, although I've been, I've been talking about it a bit for a while, why were sauropodomorphs successful in the Triassic when ornithischians were rare and absent and theropods rare? Well, it was their unique ability to access a food source that they had no other real competition for. So this is shown basically the scale of a core prosauropod and a more derived Triassic sauropodomorph compared to some of the other more common herbivores they lived side by side with. So uh, the armored pseudosuchians that were herbivores. Here's a psilosaurid. Here is a big um, dicynodont uh, therapsid. And you know none of these forms down here could rear up. So they can eat a lot of vegetation, but only low. Whereas even without rearing up, uh, Something like Melanorosaurus or Platyosaurus is able to feed higher. And of course, if they do rear up, they can feed extremely high compared to these other forms. So their envelope, their feeding envelope, the volume in which they could get access food is much greater than these other animals. Now, in the recording I did last week, you know, that 12-minute well, recording, I talked about this important event the Carnian pluvial event, the um, two million year interval in which the amount of rain that was falling around the world seemed to have greatly increased. And it causes, or it is associated with, I'll say that much, uh, some major transitions, both in the marine realm, which we're not going to cover, and the terrestrial realm. And one of the things that happens is that a lot of the small body competition of the basal sauropodomorphs, so here's a basal sauropodomorph, here are some of their uh, therapsid and diap diapsid competitors. These guys greatly get reduced in numbers, whereas these guys become the core prosauropods during this interval of, cold, of, 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 sorry, of great wetness. And so the interpretation that people have is this. Uh, we do know from the fossil record that there is diversification and expansion of many new groups of trees after the Carnian pluvial event, or dur during and after. Well, this wet episode leading to this diversification and expansion of new groups of trees led to the selection for specialized large tree feeders. And so now, there's this great new food source and a group of dinosaurs already there built to exploit it. All they basically had to do is get bigger. They were literally in a good position as well as figuratively in a good position to take advantage of a new, wor a new forested world. And so here's shown the scale. We've gone from these basal sauropodomorphs through the core prosauropods to forms that are technically speaking outside of sauropoda, but are getting pretty close. So we can call them near sauropods. Now these are grades, they're not clades. So these near sauropods, they're much larger than the core prosauropods. These are sort of 10 to 13 meters typically. Masses getting up there about five tons. And that makes them the largest land animals that have ever existed up until this point. I have to qualify that by land animal. There are already marine animals, including some of the ichthyosaurs, which are 10 times that. Um, but on land, nothing that had ever existed on land up until this point got anywhere near this big. And these um, are either facultative bipeds or full-on quadrupeds. And we can see that their forearms and wrists actually allow their hands to be used as feet, as front feet. And dinosaurs of this grade show up in the late Triassic and they survive into the early Jurassic. So the near sauropod forms, Melanornosaurus being an early and good example of that. 
So there's some others, Musaurus, I uh, showed you uh, some of the growth cycle of that before, Yinjosaurus up there, another form, uh, Unanosaurus, China. And it's out of this radiation that we actually get true sauropoda. So the name sauropoda means lizard feet, or lizard-footed ones, because their feet are utterly unlike lizards. They are <laughs> totally different from any lizard foot. Um, the reason Marsh gave him that name was kind of a silly one, and that is, unlike all other dinosaurs, these guys actually have little toes. That is, they have digit five of the pets. They have all five toes. And what's happened is this is a reversal. Uh, more er early branches of dinosaurs didn't have that toe. This is a reversal, and that's because the hind foot is becoming even more weight-bearing, so they're having a broader foot. But if you actually look at it, it doesn't look much like a foot of a lizard at all. Lizards have typically very long, slender toes. If he called them something like tortoise foot or elephant foot, that would have been much better, because they do have all five toes, but they're really stumpy. Um, and you know, lizards characterized by long, slender toes. So I don't know what he was on at the time. So, Sauropods, depending on our definition of them, show up in the late Triassic or earliest Jurassic and survive to the very end of the Cretaceous. However, these Triassic and early Jurassic forms are relatively rare when compared to creatures like the core prosauropods and the near sauropods. So it's really the middle Jurassic onward that's a sauropod world. And although they didn't start off any bigger than the near sauropods, they would eventually become the largest land-dwelling animals of all time, dwarfing the biggest theropods, dwarfing the biggest ornithischians, dwarfing the biggest land mammals, however, still smaller than the very largest whales, but only the very largest. So what are some of the new sauropod traits? Well, they increase the number of cervicals. So not only is the neck long, there are more neck bones. The skull is proportionally even smaller. And the front end of the snout, you can't see it from this angle, I'll show you pictures from above, is more rounded. So Lessensaurus is a Triassic one. It gives us a sense of what an early, early, early sauropod looks like. So people have long described them as something like, you know, if a snake ate an elephant, so here's a, uh, a, a version of that. But um, that's, yeah. <laughs> only in the broadest context. So Lessensaurids uh, and other basal sauropods, the oldest ones are from the late Triassic. Lessensaurus is a, an example of that. There are some very earliest Jurassic forms from Southern Africa, others from China and Europe. And although we don't have the complete hand for these earliest forms, given the shape of their forelimb and given both their precursors, the near sauropods and the later sauropods, Almost assuredly, this phase was an obligate quadrupedal phase. And obligate quadrupeds, because of their gigantic size, it's just really difficult for an animal this big to be moving around on just the hind limbs. And in fact, look at the relative size of the forelimb and the hind limb in some of these forms. So here's a reconstructed skeleton of Lessensaurus. But it's in the Triassic, so its main predator is not going to be um, you know, a carnivorous dinosaur. It's being hunted by the largest of the, of the terrestrial pseudosuchians. And here's a form from the earliest Jurassic of Southern Africa, an animal of about 12 tons. And there's an argument some people made that maybe, some of these, maybe this particular one might have actually been a facultative biped and not an obliquid quadruped. Um, and trying to get around that, people have looked at, so here we have the shaft circumference of the humerus and the shaft circumference of the femur. And definite bipedal animals are shown in red. Definite quadrupedal animals are shown in black. And then the stuff in gray are the ones that we're less certain about. So over here they include uh, these, um, uh, these uh, near sauropods and early sauropods, uh, and other sauropodomorphs. And we see some of them plot clearly among the bipeds. And this includes the core prosauropods and many of the near sauropods. But we get this uh, 
uh, Leydu Mahadi uh, that I just showed in the previous slide, or Antetra nitrous, these sort of earliest of the sauropods, and they are actually plotting in terms of their proportions among the giant, uh, among the, the pure quadrupeds. So I think it, it, it's very likely they were pure quadrupeds. Here's another one. Unfortunately, we don't have the hand on it, but given the rest of the limb proportions and the body proportions, almost certainly a strict quadruped. Now, I mentioned they tend to have rounder snouts. We don't have a lot of good skulls from animals at this phase, but we can take a look at some of it. So A over here, this is looking dorsally onto the top of the skull of a core prosauropod, a platyosaurus. And it's got a V-shaped skull. So anterior here, posterior here. This is the lower jaw. So we're not looking at the upper jaw, the lower jaw of an, one of these earliest sauropods. And look how much more rounded it is. And this is a much later sauropod. We're also looking down at this lower jaw. So a much rounder skull. Now, some of these early forms do still have a ridge on their dentary, so maybe, maybe they had um, a cheek. But it might be something else. And actually, as, as pointed out, or asked about in a previous lecture, there's some question as to whether there's something else, like a, a beak on some early sauropods. And people have argued that for a couple of reasons. For one reason, um, the bones on the outside, so the lateral bones of the dentary, are raised up. In a technical term, you don't need to know for this class, it's lateral plate. So in an earlier dinosaur, the outside bones would only be about as high as the inside bones relative to the tooth sockets. In these guys, the edges of the dentary are coming up higher to form this lateral plate. Also, there have been many cases of sauropod teeth that are found still positioned together, but outside the skull, suggesting something is holding them together. So people have suggested a beak, but so far there's no real trace of keratin involved or the type of tissue on bone that would be associated with keratin. So maybe it was just really gummy. Maybe there's a lot of gum holding it together. Uh, you know, other soft tissue. We just don't really know. Now, if there had been a fleshy cheek before, we lose it at the next phase. This is a phase that some people call Gravisoria, which is the heavy reptiles. On the other hand, some people call the clade I'm talking about here, they, they restrict sauropoda to this group. And the lessomsaurids and so forth, they say, are near sauropods. And the sauropod workers are fighting that out. I'm going in this class with sauropoda being you know, lessomsaurids and Gravisaurs. But eventually, the sauropod workers will sort that out. Um, these forms no longer have any evidence of a fleshy cheek. Additionally, the jaws in general have a new configuration. In these forms, and indeed in most dinosaurs, for that matter, in most diapsids, they have what I call a wraparound overbite. That is, the entire tooth row of the upper jaw surrounds the entire tooth row of the lower jaw. So those teeth from the lower jaw come up, they're inside the space of the upper jaw. Theropods have that, many ornithischians have that um, to some degree, although they play around with moving parts of the jaw. Uh, and the earlier sauropodomorphs had that. But at this point, we now get tooth-to-tooth -to -tooth occlusion. So the teeth of the upper jaw touch the teeth of the lower jaw. We're familiar with that because that's what we got. Mammals have that. Tooth, tooth occlusion. And in gravity sores, we no longer have much flexion at the elbows. Even the quadrupeds we've seen so far have sort of flexed elbows. Now we have very columnar, that is column-like forms. They can still move their elbows, sure, but they're holding them basically like columns. And it causes changes of the, um, of the configuration of the humerus, for instance. So here is what a typical Gravisaurian bite would be. And that is, in our case, tooth-to-tooth -tooth occlusion is a one-on-one -on -one thing. An upper tooth and a lower tooth both contact each other. In the case of Gravisaurians, each lower tooth contacts two teeth from above, and each tooth from above contacts two teeth from below. So they're sort of fitting in between in sort of a zigzag. But the net result is the same. There's a lot of wear between them, and they're cropping together really well. 
Additionally, changes at the jaw joint allows a much wider gape, so the ability to swing that jaw far more open and close it. And consequently, there's no more trace of that skin, skin cheek, if indeed there was a, a skin cheek to begin with. And these are adaptations for the primary mode of feeding of most sauropods, called bulk browsing. So if you're going to be a giant animal, you need to get a lot of food into your body. And one way of uh, dealing with that is to forego much in the way of mouth processing. So you don't process your food very much in your mouth. You just chomp, 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 huge amounts of it, swallow it, and then let the gizzard, where you swallowed some rocks, some gizzard stones, and your guts grind it up and digest it. And by losing the fleshy cheek, if it was there, and by allowing a wider gape, then you could basically just hoover up and chop up a whole bunch more plants quickly and get more into you to digest a lot more food. So bulk browsing, a standard adaptation for the more derived members of sauropoda. So some of the changes from a, a Triassic sauropod, like Lessomsaurus, to a Gravisaurian, we go from flexed forelimbs to more columnar forelimbs. Also, we've added additional sacrals. So Lessomsaurids and other earlier sauropodomorphs, they only had three sacrals. That's sort of the standard for dinosaurs. We start adding more sacral vertebrae, and that kind of makes sense. We're getting even bigger animals. We're getting more weight support. And it helps to have more connections between your vertebrae and your pelvis. And taking a look at the humerus, so a primitive sauropod, like Lessensaurus and, uh, and others in that phase, a lot of big muscle attachment points and so forth because they're still moving it around a lot more like a, a, a biped's humerus. In something like a gravity sore, it's very much reduced to just being a column. It's just doing this. So we have a number of pretty well-preserved animals at this part of the tree. It's sort of the base of Gravisauria and the base of the next phase up, the Eusauropods. So here's an example. Uh, skull is imperfectly known. Parts of the limbs are imperfectly known. That's a really good skeleton. This is Spinophorosaurus. And so it's representing this next phase, well, probably the exact position of Spinophorosaurus is debated called eusauropoda. That name eu in it, that word element, is for true or good. So, like euphonious is something that sounds good. Or euphemism is a way of restating something so it sounds more pleasant than it really is. Um, so eusauropod, the good or true sauropods. These are typically much long, larger. You know, we saw 10 meter examples of dinosaurs before. In these, in the eusauropods, a 10 meter eusauropod is a small eusauropod. Many of them are sort of the 15 to 20 meter range. Just a reminder, 20 meters is 66 feet. And some are like 8 to 15 tons. But some can be very much more than that. Skull, even proportionally smaller. And the ancestral air sacs that were present in early Sauriscians. Now remember, I talked about that as being a Sauriscian trait. And it's a shame that Seeley didn't call these guys like pneumatospondyly, the air vertebrae. That uh, would have been a better name. <laughs> that these begin to expand. They go away from the posterior cervicals to other parts of the body, and the, the, the amount of invasion of the air sacs of the bone in any individual bone increases. And eusauropods have very characteristic changes to their hands and their feet. So let's take a look at some of these. Oh, another thing. They tend to have long, upturned necks, although that probably was true of the earlier sauropodomorphs as well. There had been a debate for a while, particularly in the late 90s and early 20, 21st century, that these guys held their necks out horizontally. And that was based on some computer modeling. But more recent work looking at those joints suggests, no, the sort of swan neck was probably much more the normal, the neutral position. Although they could hold it straight out, another reason they couldn't. So here we see actually both 
versions modeled. So we have the Diplodocus with its neck out straight, and a Giraffe Titan with the long upturned neck. But we would regard Diplodocus as capable of, and probably normally held holding its neck in more of a swan-like pose. And looking at some recent studies of neck flexion and so forth, uh, here's Spinophorosaurus, uh, the one I showed the skeleton of before. Another addition to this reorientation is the transformation of the sacrum in these dinosaurs. That the sacrum in dinosaurs in this part of the tree is a little more upwards built. Now, not always extreme as it is in Brachiosaurus here, but a little more upwards built than it is in earlier branches of the um, sauropodomorpha. And that's part of sort of a being oriented more upwards. So why did the animals get so big? Well, there are several different hypotheses which are not mutually exclusive. One is, if feeding up in the trees is, was the main selective aspect of sauropodomorph history, then just competition with each other might select for those that could be higher and higher and higher into trees. And an easy way of getting higher into trees is to be, be bigger. Another transformation, another reason for becoming large, um, is defense against predators. One of the most effective way of being able to hold off a predator is to be bigger than it, you know, in the past as well as, to, as today. So there is, there does seem to be, to a certain degree, an arms race between the carnivores and the, the herbivores. That said, this applies to the adults. The babies, of course, are going to be within the food range of the, uh, of the carnivores, but, you know, if you can outgrow them, if you could survive your childhood, you may eventually be essentially immune to attack. Also, it increases your gut space, so you can consume more vegetation and digest it more completely. Plants, remember, take longer to digest than meat, and so the longer you have it in your body, the more nutrients you get pulled out of it. Um, other groups of, of, uh, there are groups of herbivorous mammals that increase the amount of time their food stay in their guts through a lot more complicated fashions, like um, rabbits that basically poop out food and eat it again, so it passes through twice, it's gross, but it works for them, and that way they get twice as much time for each bit of food going through their guts. Um, or, you know, um, the uh, ruminants, uh, some of the hoofed mammals, have multiple chambers in their stomach that process it down through several different stages to try to extract every last good calorie out of it. Sauropods, uh, sauropods and you sauropods in particular, they may have done it in a much simpler way, and that is just being so big, it takes a long time for the food to get through, and by the time it poops out, there's basically no nutrients left in it. None of these are mutually exclusive, and so they all might be at play. Now, as an aside, in the old days, in the late 19th and early 20th century, there was uh, this image that sauropods were too big to be able to walk on land. And so they had to be buoyed up in the water in order to move. And additionally, after that thought, they thought, well, with these long necks, and the fact, as we'll see, that many of them have nares placed relatively high on their head, maybe these things were snorkeling around. And I will admit, it was sort of a, um, a cool image. And, you can see old-timey movies that show this. The sauropods is, you know, sticking their heads out of the water and looking around and then pulling it back in. And then they come up on land, you see how big the animal is. Uh, the problem is, snorkeling wouldn't work for them. So think about this. Think about going to a pool and having a, you know, a rubber hose, going down to the deepest part of the pool, like a 30-foot pool at a deep pool, and trying to breathe through it. It's not going to work. Because all that water pressure is going to hold in your lungs, you can't expand your lungs against it, you're not Superman. Additionally, unless that hose is reinforced, it's going to get compressed. You know, in the old timey days, when people would go down snorkeling, uh, sorry, not snorkeling, uh, go down in, 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 not scuba suits, but the old fashioned uh, pressurized suits, they had to have someone actively pumping with an actual pump on the surface or with a machine to pump the air down the hose. Um, so, this probably wouldn't work. The air pressure would probably have compressed the neck too much, and the lungs wouldn't be able to push 
the, the, the ribs wouldn't be able to push against all that volume of water. When you think about big animals in the water today, when they're snorkeling, like a hippo or a whale, they're actually right near the surface. They just have a couple nostrils that stick up very close above the surface, but the volume of the body is very close to the surface, where it's easier to displace. Yeah? Isn't there also like this sort of, like, really old paleo meme that was going around where sauropods were too massive to bite do it on land, so they did it exclusively in shallow. That's not an old one, that's a new one. Oh. That's a brand new one from a, a pseudoscientist, he's a science writer, but in this case he's a pseudoscientist, who basically, he just couldn't, it, the argument for personal incredulity, he couldn't see how they did it on land, so they had to have done it in the water. Well, no, they, they could do it on land, elephants can do it on land. Anyway, uh, and part of the evidence for this is that many sauropods, have the nares, that's the evidence, placed way up on the top of their head. And so people thought, okay, well, that these may, be, may have been like blowholes. So here is the Plodocus, here is uh, Brachiosaurus, and those are the nares. But we'll see that's not where the nostrils were. But first, let's talk about the use sauropod hands and feet. So what we see here is on the left, a hand, and on the right, the pes, the, the foot, of giraffe and titan, a used sauropod. A and D were looking down on top of the metacarpals, or metatarsals. B and E were looking at it from anterior view. And C and F were looking at it from below, sort of. We're actually looking at our footprints. So a record of what they look like from below. So in the hand, the metacarpus is vertical, and it forms a horseshoe shape. So they're not, are, they're not oriented like ours, you know, side to side. They wrap around to form sort of a horseshoe. And they form basically a column, a weight-supporting column. The number and the size of the phalanges are greatly reduced. In some, not in this case, but in some, manual uncle one, so the thumb claw, is actually still pretty big. In this case, it's small. We will see on Monday an example of a group that loses fingers altogether. And so we see the footprint of a eusauropod for the hand is sort of this weird horseshoe shape. Okay, so that's the hand. The pes, the foot. Metatarsals one through five all have digits. So that's a, reverse, a reversal from the ancestral case uh, of dinosaurs in the case of five. That's our sauropod tree. They're arranged to form a broad surface. And although technically speaking, technically speaking, they're degenerate. They're walking on the balls of their feet. They cheat because they've got wedge shoes. The wedge there is made of a big fleshy pad. So the bones are held in a degenerate posture. But underneath them, is this big, fleshy, fatty pad. So when we see the footprint, it looks like it's a plantigrade foot, even though they're not plantigrade. They're not walking on the soles of their feet. They've created a wedge underneath it. So this is what the footprint of a eusauropod looks like. Yeah? This is also what elephants do, which is why their skeletons on their, like their back legs, they kind of look a little Exactly. So it's very similar to what happens in elephants, and which is why Elephantopoda would have been such a proper name for this group if only Marsh was thinking. So here's a reconstruction of what the foot looks like from below based on the actual footprints. So just a couple more slides to wrap up this phase. Air sacs in the vertebrae. As I mentioned, air sacs are present in theropods, they're present in sauropodomorphs. And in later sauropod groups, so at this phase we're at, uh, they begin to spread throughout the body. And the internal chambers get more complex. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing in black, these are through CT scans, these are vertical slices of vertebrae. And the white space, that's air, or air sacs at least. So you see they uh, start with sort of chambers, and eventually, have like spongy texture on the inside. And from lateral side, from lateral view, we can see the spaces that those air sacs would occupy and the holes, the foramina, where they would invade the bone. 
And just to give you, uh, to wrap this up, uh, we can see here is a view from the side of the bone. That would be the air sacs on them. And so for their size, sauropods, at least these derived sauropods, are probably a lot lighter than you would expect because a lot of their volume is occupied by air. So we will pick up the, the U sauropod story next time and eventually get to the largest animals that ever lived on land.